Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi there, everybody. Thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act 2. As you can see, my business partner, Art Kirsch, and I are with the fabulous virtual gourmet himself, Mr. John Mariani. <laughs> John, good to see you. Nice to be back. You know what, John? This is a little bit um, not as timely as it could have been had we uh, uh, taped this a while back, but um, uh, we recently um, uh, celebrated, certainly in our household, Talk Like a Pirate Day. And I'll let John do that interpretation. And um, I was thinking about um, uh, uh, pirates and what they drank, because you're an expert on everything. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of stuff that we associate with pirates and how I, it might have gotten, gotten, into, gotten into the general population? I, you, I take out a land level like you and feed you nothing but bread and water. And a bread with worms in it, and Ooh. a wolf with the bilge. That's what we serve land lovers like you. But we more sophisticated pirates, like Jean Lafitte and stuff, um, <clears throat> we were generally, because of the great, I mean, we've always had pirates going back to the Phoenicians and the Romans and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and on board, they would probably be drinking wine, aged wine, um, of not very good caliber. But the great days, the glory days, of pirating, of course, start, starts at around the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And this is when rum becomes very, very important because of the uh, new colonies in the New World where uh, they grew sugarcane. Um, sugarcane was not um, um, a native to the Americas. Uh, it was brought there, and they found a grew well there. And what you needed was uh, slaves uh, from Africa to work the plantations. It was uh, pretty rough. It was called a triangular trade because they would grow the cane, they would turn it into molasses, they would ship that, uh, they would they ship the, the sugar cane up, the molasses might be made in New England, then shipped back and made into rum in the Caribbean and then shipped back to Europe. Uh, it was called a triangular trade. And um, rum, as opposed to uh, whiskey, other whiskeys uh, like like malt whiskey and, and scotch and so forth, which is made from wheat or uh, and, and potatoes in terms of vodka, um, rum has to be made with sugar cane uh, or and or molasses. So since it was right there in the very regions of the world where the uh, pirates were. Uh, constantly attacking uh, in the Atlantic um, uh, Ocean, um, which you see in all the great movies, Captain Blood and so forth. Come on, me hearties, and they would be breaking out the rum. Uh, and this um, was also part of what was called the rum ration in the Royal Navy, the British Navy, and that every man on board would get his rum ration. And grog is rum that is mixed with a little bit of water, which was generally the truth, because you don't want the guys falling off the yardum, you know, after they have their, after they have their grog. Um, so, and that was true. And they had the rum ration, which they tried to take away at some point in the 19th century. And bluey, the, the, the sailors would have nothing, none of that. They'd, they'd pull a Captain Bly on anybody who tried to do that. But, um, so it really wasn't until I don't know, 1950s or 60s that the Royal Navy said, no, no, no more of this. You guys want to go out and get drunk on the weekends or R and R go right ahead. We're not going to be serving rum every day to every one of you. Hmm. So uh, in addition to grog, there are things like uh, I hear like uh, mead and other mm -hmm. types of things. Is this all the same family of product? Um, no, not necessarily, but you know, it's a good thing that I happen to have a copy of the Encyclopedia of American Food and Drink, which is written by whom? It's the uh, fifth edition of my book. Ah. Uh, and it's got everything in here. Um, so as a matter of fact, I just uh, uh, took some of the docs I knew they were talking about. For, for instance, Grog, um, the name uh, comes from Edward Vernon, 1684 to 1757, whose nickname was Good Old Grog, and who tried to prevent scurvy among his crew by giving them rum and water, um, which did nothing to cure their scurvy, um, but, but it was called Old Grog's Drink. 
and uh, by the 18th century. And um, uh, it, what what cured scurvy, of course, was uh, citrus juices, um, which they didn't have on board because they don't stay fresh, but quinine, and that's where gin and tonic, uh, gin and quinine water came from, mm. um, because they have uh, your gin or rum or anything else, you put some quinine in there, and it uh, cured scurvy, which is rather nice uh, to know. So that's uh, there on page 238. Now, what, let's turn over to page 416. What do we find there? Punch. Uh, punch, an alcoholic beverage, first appearing in print in 1600. Today, it refers to a bowl of citrus or fruit-based party drink with any number of liquors and sparkling wine. And the word originally comes from the Hindu, panch, which means five, which refers to the five original ingredients that the British sailors had put into their um, had put into their punch. And um, punches, and you still, if you look at a movie like Gunga Din, um, when the British soldiers, these rough, tough guys, Cary Grant and Victor McLaughlin, uh, go to um, Douglas Fairbanks Jr. when they go to a grand party in their their the, the mufti whites, um, there's punch, there's punch. And of course, it's spiked. But um, Victor McLaughlin, of course, spikes it a lot more or brings his own whiskey along. But punch was supposed to be, you know, for the ladies, slightly titillating. Um, there'd be some sparkling water in there, and there'd be perhaps a, um, but it was mainly um, drunk for, uh, because it had these citrus juices in it. And remember, in those days, citrus juices were difficult to come by. So unless you lived in that area. But by the 19th century in America, punch parties were everywhere. And um, uh, they were made with anything that the particular region uh, would make them with. So if they were in Scotland, they'd make it with scotch. If they were in uh, the Americas, they'd probably make it with rum or uh, bourbon. And, uh, and then there's sangria. Now, sangria, of course, is Spanish. And that's a Spanish punch in which you take red wine and uh, you put into that brandy, Spanish mm. brandy, like bandador, um, and then you uh, put in a bunch of fruits, apples and stuff, and you just let them macerate in there. And sangria was very, very popular, became very, very popular in the United States after the uh, 19, was this 1961 World's Fair, 1963 World's Fair in New York, in which the Spanish pavilion was serving sangria. And it really took off after that, so I do remember in, in college that you'd go and buy Yago, Y-A-G-O, probably still yeah. around, Yago Sangria, and it was like, I don't know, 9% alcohol or, so, or something. So uh, if you're having a party with the co-eds over, you'd spike it with a little bit more of that, you know, and have some Madeira Madeira. <laughs> remember that song? Yeah, I yeah, actually quite, I remember in the 60s, Sangria was, was uh, big around our house. You would get that. By the way, uh, I hate it when, we we miss a shameless plug. Could you hold that book up again, which I'm sure people can get on Amazon? Yeah. And it's the American Food and Drink by Encyclopedia American Food and Drink, fifth edition. And it'll tell you everything you ever wanted to know about anything about American food. Not well, America, it'll, that's interesting because it is American food. You can look up Italian American food. You can look up Chinese American food. You can look up Jewish American food, but you won't necessarily find uh, pages and pages about Italian food in Tuscany or, or Sardinia, unless somehow it's translated to America. There's things like pizza and uh, and certain pasta and so on. So anyway, yeah, I, I highly, I'm very proud of this book and it has gone to five editions. And um uh, to get back to punch, one of the most famous is the Planters Punch, which came from the Planters um, uh, Hotel in St. Louis, which uh, for some reason became very popular. And you can look in any number of uh, 19th century cookbooks written by ladies like Mrs. Beaton and, uh, of course, Fanny Farmer. And uh, they would always have punch recipes. And they always say, well, you don't have to put spirits in there. Um, you know, but, uh, of course, uh, one did. And I think they're always always great, but they were constantly 
constantly the uh, butt of jokes punches. Remember in one of the Seinfeld episodes, George uh, does a double dip with his chip and is trying to get to the punch and so forth. So punch is always fun because it comes in a big bowl. Of course, the, the Three Stooges were the punch masters. Uh, if there was a punch bowl in a Three Stooges movie, you knew what was going to happen to it. <laughs> what and a that, fascinating connection you yeah. made between all of these things, starting with pirates. Pirates. Art, art. And, you know, when I'm looking, I'm looking at this image and the Three Stooges. How appropriate! Except that uh, Mariani doesn't really fit in. He's just so sophisticated. I don't know which one he would be. He would be probably the the puppet master. Well, I'm not as mean as Mo, and I'm not as uh, non-specific as uh, Larry. And who doesn't love Curly? I mean, huh. Curly does. A phenomenon, um, but um, and and good with it. Good with a custard pie too. Um, I did before going want to uh, also reference eggnog. Um, mm. Eggnog, which is here on what page is that on here? Oh, there it is. Eggnog, also egg pop. I don't know anybody who with that. Um, made with eggs and spirits, traditionally served in America at Christmas time. The word nog is an old English term for ale uh, since the late 17th century. And in England, they used to make it with Spanish wine. But in America, where it first appears in print in 1765, it was usually rum and um, bourbon. My father made it with scotch. And eggnog was extremely popular. Not so much today because you know, it's very heavy and it's got cream and it's got you know all of these dairy products. But also because they start to warn you that you can't put raw egg yolks into something that has to be cooked. Well, not going to cook, you know. Now, how many people do you think have ever gotten sick on a couple of eggs that are in a quart or a gallon of eggnog? It's just absolutely preposterous. But you could buy uh, the already pasteurized uh, egg yolks, which you can buy in a store. Or you can buy the already pasteurized carton of eggnog and then spike it um, yourself. And um, to me, it really is, the, it's the smell of Christmas, it's the taste of Christmas. Um, it, it, it goes with whatever your mother is baking in the oven for Christmas and the scents of uh, the cookies and so forth. It's uh, something that isn't quite as popular as it used to be, but certainly should be. Oh, it's too filling. Don't fill up on eggnog, we were told, right? <laughs> Well, between the grog and uh, uh, eggnog and everything else, we're we're ready for the holidays. Yeah, me too. John, thank you. Thank you. For more on celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life. <laughs>